In this week's episode, I'm joined by Lisa Mulligan, CEO of the Culture Ministry. This week, our conversation is about free medical school tuition, Unilever's Believe in Talent Initiative, women in motorsports, and more. Hey there, my name is Bernadette Smith. Welcome to Five Things in 15 Minutes, my weekly show where I bring good vibes to DEI. That is good vibes to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a little dash of corporate social responsibility. What I found is that there are lots of news stories about what's going wrong in the world and lots of negative data, but there are also a lot of things going right. That's what I like to focus on. I search for DEI stories that we can be inspired by and learn from. My hope is to inspire you to experiment with some of these inclusive actions and policies within your own organization to help you build a more inclusive world. Let's get started. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me. Will you please introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Bernadette. That was um, a really great introduction and I love what you're doing. It's so great to be talking about the positive things in DNI. So yes, I'm the CEO of the Culture Ministry and it's my mission to make organisations more inclusive and accessible so people and businesses can thrive. Yeah, and yeah, I primarily work across Asia Pacific, so Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand are probably the main markets that I support, and that's because I've lived in this part of the world my whole life. Yeah, That's awesome. And where are you now? I am in Auckland, New Zealand. Excellent. And you used to be Chief Diversity Officer of a global company, is that right? Yes. So you've seen yes. some things or two. <laughs> I have. I have seen a few things. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. You know, when I was writing this week's newsletter, I wanted to focus on um, you know, a story that I remember from last year, which was we lost a client who didn't, they didn't renew with us because they didn't have a protected diversity, equity, and inclusion budget. In fact, they specifically said to me, um, because DEI was in human resources, they had to prioritize employee salaries. Well, you know, I get that. Absolutely get that. But it's sort of a, a really good reason that DEI should have its own protected budget and not be part of HR at all. And so yeah. I was wondering kind of what your experience with that has been in the past. Yeah, really good question, actually. And I think budget is a massive issue for people working in DNI. When I first accepted um, a DEI role in leadership, I had no budget and I was the only person in the very large organisation kind of anointed to do this work. And, you know, eventually, and with the murder of George Floyd, that precipitated then, oh, we, we should have a budget for this work. I'm like, yay, mm. we have budgets for everything else. But but there were still challenges accessing that budget. But I agree, if it's part of your HR budget, it gets pushed and pulled in all directions. And, of course, we should pay our people. I mean, you know, that's that's the basics, right? Sure. But, but I think if it is separate and protected, you have a better chance of being able to implement some of the things you need to do. Yeah, absolutely. And when you were in that role, were a lot of – the DEI initiatives or whatever you were able to get traction on, was that, were they primarily HR related or were they part of other functions within the company? Um, I, I guess they were still primarily HR related. I think, yeah. you know, where the idea that DEI should be separate from the people function, even though it is all about people, I think that's still emerging. So yeah, yeah. at the time it was still part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it always makes me it, it always gives me hope when I see uh, organizations, companies committing to supplier diversity, because there's a lot of money there, right? In in spending, and so I think that's actually something that's we're going to talk about in when we get to this week's good vibes. But I just think it's really important when there is a protected budget and when DEI is seen as something that fits into all of every, with every function where it's a lens that applies to all sorts of decision-making. And yeah. when the DEI leaders don't report to HR, when they have direct reporting to the CEO. 
Yeah. Agree. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing. What's something that you, that's getting you excited and giving you hope right now? Yeah, I think, look, there's a lot of talk out there in the world that organizations are pulling back from their DEI work and slashing budgets. Um, and I am sure that's true in organizations. But the thing that's giving me hope is when I'm talking to my clients and I'm talking to organizations, people do want to do better. Yeah. And they, they, and you, and you don't see this in the newspapers and, and online, but when you're talking to individuals, there are good people out there who are wanting to make a difference. So I feel really happy and optimistic about that kind of work. The other work that I'm doing is working with leaders on how to build inclusion into their into their into their practice, mm -hmm. into what they do every day. So it's part of what their work is. Um, and the other thing I'm really excited about is um, I've somehow gotten involved in self ID and data work. So helping organisations configure their systems so that they can collect more data about their people you know, beyond male and female, which is awesome, so that they understand, okay, what do we need to do and how can we track our progress by having that data? Yeah, so they can better tailor their interventions and equity initiatives. That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Very cool. Well, let's get into this week's good vibes. Yay. All right, the first story, <laughs> the first story <laughs> this week comes from Charlotte Tilbury, which made history as the first female-founded beauty brand to sponsor the 2024 F1 Academy, aiming to empower women drivers. So what's happening is that Tilbury is investing in the sponsorship program, which is working with 15 young women drivers, breaking barriers in a heavily male-dominated field. I think this is fantastic. You know, sometimes these stories are very random, Lisa. <laughs> Do you know, do you watch Drive to Survive on Netflix? I don't. So, the, oh, so amazing documentary about the F1 race every year. It is filled with, you know, fast cars and beautiful, pretty men um, and incredible personalities. And, you know, I love watching it. It's so cool. But there are no women. Ah. <laughs> if there's any women in the F1, they tend to be more in support roles. You, there's very few women. So, you know, ahead of International Women's Day this week, Charlotte Tilbury is living the UN women's theme of investing in women and accelerating progress. I mean, that is such a match for what she has done. I can't wait to see more women in this sport. I can't wait to see uh, women taking on the men at their own game. I just, I think it's so cool. And she's doing it in her own way. She's not doing it like a man. She has branded her cars with lips and lipsticks and the colours that she produces in her business. Um, I, I just think it's incredible. It is. You know, so I, I'll be honest <laughs> I'd never heard of that brand before. I don't oh. watch that show. So this is all like all new to me, but I'm glad that it has such like personal resonance with you and I, and I'm sure a lot of other folks. So yeah. that is so, so cool. Especially you're right in international women's month. Yeah. I was so excited when that, when you'd sent me that article, I was like, yeah, I've seen this one. I think it's amazing. Awesome. All right. The second story this week is from Walmart, which is aiming to fast track their employees into 100,000 well-paying artificial intelligence and tech jobs in three years. And they're doing that by offering a lot more short form certificate programs. So these are four month programs. They have now over 50 of them focused on tech and AI so they can get their employees upskilled and ready to go. Now, it does mean that they are reducing their degree program offerings, um, but those were not so utilized anyway. So this is really great news for their workers, a lot of whom are BIPOC. Yeah, I think this is a, a great example of an organization really understanding what's going on, really understanding their talent and really understanding what the future looks like for Walmart and where are the skills that they are missing and then investing back in their people. And, you know, back in 2018 when they were supporting degrees, 
amazing and that was probably right at the time but they've realized things have moved and we you know instead of ensuring or insisting people have degrees to get a job they're saying actually we need AI skills or we need technology skills and we're going to invest in you to get that and we're going to pay you more when we put you in those jobs I mean so cool so it cool. is so cool. And those employees, I think they have to pay like $1 a day to get these uh, certificates. So it's a really low barrier for them, yet there's still some accountability. Um, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's, you know, I've seen lots of organizations talking about, oh, we're just going to recruit on skill or we only want the skills. But I think Walmart is actually doing it. And um, I hope lots of other organizations follow. I I do too. All right. The third story comes from Unilever, which launched its Believe in Talent initiative last year. Somehow I missed it. Um, And it mandates disability representation behind the camera. So what the, the idea is, is that for every ad, so Unilever is a consumer packaged goods company. And so they have a lot of ads. And so for every ad with a budget over $107,000 US, they're committing to have a person with disability behind the camera to help with representation on screen and inclusion. Um, and also to give these folks a shot. I love it. Yeah. It's really cool, right? And when you think about 16% of the world's population has a disability. Yeah. And that is growing because we're seeing in most of the world this aging population. So you know, we're going to have more and more people with disabilities. And so for Unilever to say, well, you know, we have a responsibility. We spend a lot of money advertising our products out in the community. We need to represent what our community looks like. And by having people behind the scenes in the production, they're going to advocate for people with disabilities. They're going to say, hey, you know, are we actually representing the people that we sell our products to? So yeah, go Unilever. I think it's a a fantastic initiative. Yeah, I do too. Another part of it is that they created this guide, like a toolkit on how to do Mm. this and it's open source. So anyone can actually go and download that toolkit on how to involve people with disabilities behind the camera. They sent this toolkit to all of their advertising partners. So, I mean, I think that part is really meaningful as well. So it's, it's something that is replicable. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, you know, it's not just saying we're not going to just mandate this. We're actually going to help the people that we work with work Mm -hmm. with us to make it happen. Really, really amazing. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, the fourth story this week comes from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which is located in New York City, one of the poorest neighborhoods of New York City, which received a $1 billion donation from Ruth Gottsman, And this is uh, uh, really going to help a lot of underrepresented folks who are really struggling to pay their medical school tuition, which averages over $200,000 in debt. So um, an amazing, amazing gift for these young, young people. I think this is my favorite story for the week. And there is a video, many videos on TikTok, which is how I learned about this story. And it's of Ruth announcing to quite a large student body in one of the lecture halls um, about her her donation, which just blows me away. And the exuberance and the excitement about the students who who are mainly BIPOC as well. So um, as you said, this donation happened in a college in one of the poorest boroughs in New York. The impact that this is going to have on students now, but also for communities in the future, we know that black and brown people, when they go to the doctor, aren't believed, um, are dismissed, are discriminated against. This is creating something for the long term where we're going to have doctors from the community who are supporting the community and providing great health care. You should go have a look at the video on TikTok if you haven't seen it. Um, you can probably Google Ruth and Albert Einstein College and it will come up and it's incredible. Yeah, I will definitely have to check that out. I, uh, <laughs> As you were talking, I got goosebumps. I mean, yeah. you said that so well because you're right. There are major racial health disparities, uh, mm. unequitable outcomes, and and it's because there is a lack of representation in, and there's a physician shortage, not just among 
people of color, but there's a physician shortage in general. And uh, yeah. to do something to chip away at the uh, disparate health outcomes would be amazing. So thank you. Yeah. Really, really well said. All right. Thank you. <laughs> and the fifth story this week comes from the state of New Jersey here in the U.S., which will soon recognize LGBTQ plus business certification. So my company is certified as an LGBTBE. Very few states here in the U.S. actually recognize that certification for their supplier diversity budget within their budget. But the state of New Jersey soon will, alongside recognizing uh, certification about women, people of color, and veterans. So it'll only be the third state in the country. So this is a really big deal in terms of potentially creating more equity. Yeah. And it's such a good good news story for someone who sits outside of the U.S. and and looks at some of the states in the U.S. and what they're doing for the um, LGBTIQ plus community, or should I say against um, the Mm -hmm. community. I I think this is a, you know, leading the way and it's, and it's right. I mean, big organizations want to work with diverse suppliers, but from my understanding up until now, you could work with women owned businesses or black and brown owned businesses um, so to have a certification that recognizes the LGBTIQ plus community and the impact that you make mm-hmm. is incredible. And I noticed in this article they were talking about creating legislation that means it couldn't be wound back. Yeah. Was that your understanding? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, I think we've learned some lessons in the US about <laughs> how laws can be changed and rolled back. And so I thought that was such an important part of the piece and such yeah. um, a positive step in the state of New Jersey. Yeah, it absolutely is. And that's actually a good segue to this week's call to action, which is partly about the anti LGBTQ plus legislation here in the US. Mm-hmm. Um, so, folks, I would really encourage you to learn about Next Benedict who use they, them pronouns. They were a non-binary teen in Oklahoma who was bullied at school and beaten by classmates and then later died. There are really no answers yet, Um, but they were from Oklahoma. And Oklahoma legislators are currently considering 54 anti-LGBTQ plus bills. So I'm going to put a little bit of information about that story in the show notes so you can make sure to learn a little bit more about Next Benedict and and what's happening here uh, in our country with anti-LGBTQ laws. But yes, that was some good vibes from New Jersey, Lisa. (laughs) So (laughs) it's a really strange patchwork here um, with states' rights. Yeah. It's good to see a step in the right direction. That's right. It is. So Lisa, how can folks keep in touch with you? Yeah, there's a number of ways. I'm very active on this platform. You can find me um, under my name. Um, You can also find my business, The Culture Ministry, on LinkedIn. Um, And I have a website. So if you want to learn more about what I do, go to www.thecultureministry.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks for joining me. Everyone watching, hope you have a great week. And if you don't already get the Five Things newsletter, you can subscribe at Five Things, DEI. Dot com. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to Five Things in 15 Minutes. I hope you found yourself inspired by at least one of this week's stories. If you did, would you mind sharing it with a colleague and leaving us a review on your favorite podcasting platform? And if you don't already get my Five Things newsletter, join at fivethingsdei.com. I'm Bernadette Smith. And I'll see you next week right here for five things in 15 minutes, bringing good vibes to DEI.